Um, I was talking to Robin Kelly before the event, and he was saying that he was up late last night listening to Fred's music and trying to focus what his remarks would be. And I've spent all night and all day trying to figure out what my remarks are going to be to try to frame and comprehend somebody as amazing as Fred Hub. Um, he almost defies, he stretches the brain to try to grasp the number of revolutionary interventions that he's trying to make and is making uh, in the struggle against racism and imperialism. Um, so I have a bunch of things to read. Um, hold on a second. So the first thing, in my opinion, is Fred as an evangelist. And reading in my uh, book, Playbook for Progressives, it says the role of the evangelist is to recruit and retain people in the movement by touching their deepest feelings and aspirations. The evangelist calls for a personal transformation, a conversion of values, a commitment to a larger whole and a broader cause. So if we're going to discuss personal and societal transformations, they have to be going on in a parallel manner. Then you have Fred's body of work, which is no way that I can fully explain, but just I use his book sometimes in the CDs. There's Diary of a Radical Cancer Warrior, because Fred's going to talk about his ongoing struggle with cancer at a molecular, cellular, and societal level. Fighting cancer and capitalism at the cellular level. Uh, this, his great book, Afro-Asia, about the reflection of the Black and Asian Pacific Island movement. There's the Black Panther Suite, which is a DVD, which we have available here. There's Big Red, which is uh, a, a CD of some of Fred's really finest baritone sax work. As we come in today, there's the Jazz Messenger that has an interview with Fred. We have Diane Ficino, who's uh, going to be on the panel, and she's the author of a book, Yuri Kochiyama, Heartbeat of Struggle, and also uh, the editor of Wicked Theory, Naked Practice, the Fred Ho Reader. If you notice one thing about Fred and all his covers, he's naked. <laughs> so that seems to be one recurrent theme in his ideological development. Um, now, this, uh, well, Fred's going to talk about himself. Hold on a second. There was one thing in the uh, Fred Ho Reader, there's a lot of things, but I just want to read this paragraph. This is Fred talking about himself. I'm a Chinese American musician who plays the baritone saxophone. I mean, composes what I call Afro-Asian, New American, multicultural music. I am not a musician of Chinese descent in America who happens to play and compose core jazz. For most of my life, African American and Asian American culture and politics have been both synonymous and, son and synonymous. I am self-taught, so I was spared the Eurocentric cultural indoctrination and training that occurs in conservatory training in the process of getting an MFA. When I became a revolutionary, I understood that ethnicity is not sufficient unless it proceeds from a consciousness and identification with all oppressed peoples. The Asian American movement gave me a pan-Asian sensibility, and since I reject white supremacy, my American heritage meant the predominant musical tradition of African Americans. So we come here today as participants in the labor community strategy send a vision of what we call the anti-racist, anti-imperialist united front. And that's a broad united front, it's a strategy. Strategy means something that does not change for our entire balance of forces in a society. You can change your tactics, but there's an evolution of your tactics within this anti-racist, anti-imperialist united front that began in, in the United States in 1492. That's right. And is continuing to today. And the reason it's very important to talk about the anti-racist, anti-imperialist United Front 
is that we have the obligation as revolutionaries to constantly inject anti-racism and anti-imperialism into every single conversation. Because if we don't, we're either going to talk about public health and personal health in an anti-racist, anti-imperialist context, or as someone else will say, well, why do you need to say that? The reason is because if you don't say that, you're discussing personal health in a racist, imperialist context. That's the default. The, the, the unspoken default is, well, I'm not that political, I just want to deal with, I really came to hear Fred about cancer, or I came to hear Fred about music, or I can't, came to hear Fred about the raw diet. I don't think any of us came all the way here to discuss any of those subjects outside of the common context that we share, which is a revolutionary opposition to US imperialism and the effort to try to build social movements inside the society that are part of an international movement. Eric Dolphy, who played baritone, uh, uh, I mean, it's a bass clarinet, was able to produce both the bass line and melodic line simultaneously. See, we heard it t today. So I just want to acknowledge that. And then there are three things I just want to uh, have, have us talk about. Because uh, I really want to talk about the music. One is the return of the big band. Big band music, for those of you who follow, even for those of you who follow jazz, big band music is never appreciated. We don't realize that almost every great artist, um, every great artist wanted to have a big band because the big band was the voice. It was the black voice, okay? And it's interesting that, you know, like at least three of your heroes, Charles Mingus, Sun Ra, Cal Massey, um, there's a way in which you're returning to the big band as a particular form, a particular voice late in your work seems very, very significant. Uh, you know, you talk about the big band as um, a kind of training ground for young musicians. Uh, you talk about your experiences working with Gil Evans Big Band, with Charlie Persip's Super Band, with Archie Shep's Attica Blues Band. Uh, the fact that one of your first works that was re-recorded or done on Big Red was itself a big band blues. Um, and I want to talk, I want you to talk about what the big band meant, why you made that aesthetic decision, that political decision in some ways, to return to what you call the quintessential American orchestra. Two reasons, Robin. Um, in 2008, when I was diagnosed uh, with a new cancer t tumor number three, tumor number three in December of 2008. Uh, I was, uh, for the first two tumors, tumor number one, I was given two out of three chances of living. Not too bad. Tumor number two, I was given one out of two chances of living. Okay. Tumor number three, I was given one in 30,000 chances of living. So I, I really knew time was gonna be short and I wanted to, get together with all the musicians that I've enjoyed working with over 30 years. And so that had to be a big band because there's so many. Uh, so that was one thing. But the other thing that, that uh, I think it was more of, of an artistic political motivation, not, not a personal one as the first one was, is that um, I uh, feel uh, that um, uh, the big band is an impossible thing to sustain today. All the big band leaders, you know, Ellington, probably the greatest one, struggled mightily just to keep that kind of ensemble afloat. Because unlike the symphony orchestras, which every alleged great city in America is supposed to have one and is hugely subsidized, this music called, quote unquote, jazz, which indeed is America's classical music, isn't subsidized. So it's very, very hard to keep 16 to 18 people employed, working constantly. And uh, in my journey, I'm very fortunate because many artists want to work with me. And they just realize uh, they've come to appreciate my integrity, but also my artistic ex excellence. So when I say, this is all I have to pay you, can you do it? Virtually no one says no. So uh, I've been blessed with that situation. Um, but I wanted to make a statement to the jazz industry, which I've had a very oppositional relationship to. The industry, I feel, has pretty much ignored me or marginalized me. 
Um, and my statement was, was that at the end of my life, I'm going to do something impossible. I'm going to have a big band that not just for a one time out thing, we've done three records so far, and we're going to try to, if I'm healthy enough this fall, have an extended run in Harlem um, uh, uh, this fall. But you know, to, to make a point that, that my guerrilla entrepreneurship, and I've not been a nonprofit, you know, and I've not you know, sought commercial success like a Kenny G, you know, or a, a Diana Krall, you know, or a, or a Esperanza Spalding, that, you know, that, 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 that can be done, sustaining right. a big man. The other, the most important thing, though, that, that that art form of a big man, that American orchestra form is an art form that is, um, is either in the throes of regurgitation, meaning that the people who, who, who write for that form have gone through the factory now of, um, Berkeley College of Music and these other institutions, where they've learned all the formulas and they can regurgitate them well, but they have no voice themselves. But also, the the the, the form, um, the form has become has been stagnant for a long time, and I wanted to re-energize the form with all the things that I've learned in the last 30 years. For example, going beyond diatonic music, right. going into odd meters, uh, going to all these dissonant colors and so forth. Um, you know, the challenge of making uh, it popular again. Um, you know, uh, the last thing I did, Sweet Science Suite, which we premiered at the Guggenheim Museum, we had dancers with. It's very, very exciting that the big, bo big band could be popular again, but at the same time, um, musically pushing, pushing the envelope. So that, that was probably the, my, my, my primary artistic motivation, was to show that we can create 21st and 22nd century large-scale work for a large ensemble, and that the big man is indeed the American quintessential orchestra. Right, okay, that, that actually brings me to this, the next thing. In fact, what I'm gonna do is, if you don't mind, just raise three things and then leave it rather than each one individually, because they're all okay. related. This actually ties to what you just said uh, about um, your artistic motives, because one of the questions that I have is there seems to be, to me, the, the quote unquote old Fed Ho and the new Fed Ho are all one process. And in fact, I see your work as always, dialectically speaking, the break is always there, there's always a break and always a, a trans, transformation. Um, but, I'm, but to me, this seems to be sort of a, a trajectory that, that, that root, that's rooted in the older work. So I, let's take, for example, what I think is a work of genius in that sweet science suite, uh, scientific soul music honoring Muhammad Ali, um, which I know you wrote as a ballet. So the dance elements there, I know that it, for me at least hearing it, I immediately thought of Charles Mingus, Black Saint and the Sinner Lady, you know, um, it, which was Mingus's kind of black, brown and beige. Uh, and I also th was amazed by, you know, songs like Shake Up the World, which correct me if I'm wrong, not only the shifting time signatures, but it's in 15. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so I was like, wow, you know, who, who writes in 15? So there's all this chromaticism, the bass line, the funk, the, the whole piece, no Vietnamese ever call me nigger, float like a butterfly sting like an Afro-Asian bumblebee, <laughs> so it swings in 5-4. Um, and then of course you take on Duke Ellington's, you know, amazing inner sentimental mood and make it in a Pan-African mood. Uh, so I want you to sort of, talk a little bit about um, the connections between, say, those, those first recordings and what you've done. If there's, in other words, has your experience produced a new body of work? Um, and then just to, to kind of close, um, the, the, really the second or third thing has to do with music as healing. Because on page 24 of uh, Diary of, of a Radical Cancer Warrior, you talk about mis you know, listening to Coltrane, but you say you also listen to a lot of pre-industrial and primal music. Give me the example of the Ganawa, which you know, Randy Weston, of course, did a lot in terms of making the Ganawa an international phenomenon for its healing power. And you write, and I think this is a very profound statement, you write, and I want you to all listen to this, 
When recovering from surgery, the trance-like inducement of this music helped me to zone out the TV sets, the inane conversations, etc., bombarding our oral senses. It also helped me to dance lying on my back, and you talked about you know, moving your limbs. So if you could talk about those two things, the sort of trajectory of your music, particularly in relationship to, to the piece on Muhammad Ali, and then music as healing. Has, um, how, what are your thoughts about that in terms of your own process of healing, and also the way, as revolutionaries, we could think about music as a healing process? Thank you. Here's the big difference between the old Fred Ho and the new Fred Ho. The old Fred Holt was primarily concerned about art in a very broad view. You know, I, I knew art could be um, catalytic, it could uh, be inspir inspirational, it can be transgressive, all these different things. But I think the new Fred Holt understood that uh, all human activity, if it's to have meaning and value, has to operate at the cellular level and has to be um, shamanistic. More than just catalytic, it has to change our being. You know, more than just our ideas, more than just our politics, it has to change our being as physical, spiritual entities. And it, that Cellular change happens through sound, through vibration. And there's a lot of science on this as well. But I think that the ancients understood this because they're con they didn't even have a word for music per se. You know, um, and they didn't, well, even more significant, they had no word for art. There wasn't this division of labor that separated expression because if it's is to have any value or meaning, it had to be functional or effective. It had to heal us, you know? Um, and it's my view of politics or every, everything that is important. You know, it has to be medicinal. Um, we're all gonna have conflicts with each other. We're all gonna get mad at each other. We're all gonna have differences. But we have to have a transcendental capacity to heal each other. Otherwise, we're going to be damaged and toxic. Um, so I've always, you know, in the past, I've viewed music as primarily art, an, an intellectual as well as spiritual activity, but I did not understand it as this fundamental cellular force that could um, uh, make a new human being. And I've come to understand it much more because when I had those moments, as you described, I couldn't play an instrument. It was devastating. I thought, here's what, what happened. Um, one of the chemotherapy drugs, oxaliplatin, has a known side effect, and the doctors made it clear, of peripheral neuropathy, which is numbness and the uh, loss of dexterity and pain in your hands and your feet, which I still have. And I was faced with this prospect. My sister, who's a doctor, said this to me. Fred, there may be a trade-off between your life and giving up playing music. And, you know, I had to wrestle with this existential question. Is there life without music? And I, it was actually in a phone conversation with the poet Jane Cortez that I was sharing her with her my anxiety. And I said to Jane, Jane, you know, I might be alive from this chemotherapy, but, you know, I may be a lousy saxophone player. And she just laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed. I said, Jane, Jane, why are you laughing? This is like serious stuff for me. And she's Fred, she said, Fred, it's impossible for you to be a mediocre saxophone player. You're going to learn how to play this without the use of hands. <laughs> you know, and it ch changed my thinking. Yes, it may be impossible so far, but that's a challenge that I'm willing to accept. You know, I'll learn how to play the instrument without the use of my hands. You know, because the music is, a, if it's core, if it's essential core to yourself, you'll figure out a way, even if you have no limbs. Beethoven composed music when he had no hearing, you know. So, um, when I was uh, on my back in the hospital room, uh, I had an obnoxious patient uh, who uh, would be watching God-awful TV, you know, at 1 a.m., 
loud. And I would say to him, uh, sir, could you turn down your TV? And he would shout back at me, no, I paid for it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's money, right? I paid for it, so therefore I can do whatever the hell I want to. So, you know, as a Luddite, I never owned, um, what do you call those CD compact disc players? But somebody brought one by the hospital because I was telling them, look, I'm, I'm having a possible time sleeping with this guy. She said, okay, let me let, loan you my CD player. Listen to this Ganaon music. And I would listen to the Ganaon music. I would go into trance, you know. And because I couldn't get out of bed, uh, I would be dancing on my back. And uh, I learned basically from that, um, that that possessional state is what um, we all need to get to in order to get through all the crap and bullshit of our existence. We need to get to that meditative, possessional state, you know, where we surrender to the sound. And even if we don't have limbs, if we don't, don't you know, if we, we, we can't get up, stand up, we can still dance, we can still be happy, we can still be joyful, we can still celebrate the soul, you can still, uh, still affirm our humanity. And that's, to me, the greatest music, you know, when it, when it catalyzes you to do that. Now, um, in terms of my new musical work, um, there are certain things, you know, that uh, I've reconciled. And that is the relationship between improvisation and composition. I think that you can be both great improviser and a great composer and work in both forms of their very distinct forms. And what I try to do now with the Green Monster Big Band is find the greatest improvisers and the greatest sectional people, people who can read difficult music and write for them very challenging parts like the way Ellington wrote for each individual player. So I know who the players are because I chose them as my favorite players. So for example, to write, uh, like you listen to Movement 2 in Sweet Science Suite, Float Like a Butterfly, Sting Like an Afro-Asian Mumblebee, the four trumpets. There are sections where they're all written above double high C, you know, and basically they're all playing lead trumpet parts, you know, which uh, is a huge challenge. Um, you know, another thing is uh, 16 part voice writing. Now the maximum is 12 because there are only 12 notes in the Western diatonic scale. So how do you write four more parts that are not in the Western scale? So I have a great musician, an Iran, Iranian player, Hafez Modir Zadeh, who plays in Persian temperament, in quarter tones. Okay, so he's number 13 in the voicing. Then I have myself, which I can play multiphonics. That's number 14. Then number 15 is um, what I would call a floater. You know, that's, that was Taylor Holbynum who played with his plunger, all these other kinds of sounds and colors, and not even on any scale, you know? And then number 16 was the use of um, what I would call, uh, um, what I call the magic notes that are just serendipitously done by another great improviser. Even though they're with playing all that stuff within the notated arrangement, the orchestration, so, um, uh, one of the things that, that I've been gifted with is to contend with the European classical cats. You know, I've been commissioned by Tanglewood, by Carnegie Hall, Chamber Music Society of, of Lincoln Center. I can go toe to toe with those cats on, uh, as a composer. But, more, I, I, but, I don't, but unlike some of my African American counterparts who sought legitimation within that world as you know, uh, commissioned composers. Uh, my whole thing was rather than join the canon, to break the canon, to topple it. So I, when I go head to head with those guys in the classical realm, um, like when I did this piece with the American Composers Orchestra at Carnegie Hall, it was a concerto for baritone saxophone, myself playing, and the orchestra. Now those guys can't improvise, and they want everything precisely notated. So I did that. But then I wrote for my uh, gift to myself this trickster role that was their foil, you know. And I did this not not to you know um, uh, t 
to you know be nasty to them or mean spirited or contestational to them. My whole thing was that let's push the envelope even within your rigidity. Um, so what I'm trying to do is kind of like the, the opposite of, of what everyone else does. In fact, that's part of my mission. If it's already being done or someone else can do it, I don't want to do it. And that is to figure out how improvisation can be put into a highly composed context and then highly composed notated music can still be fresh and have uh, a lot of serendipitous improvisational, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 currents in it. So I would say that, that the difference from my old work is that I uh, had not been able to bridge those, those areas. And you can only do that after 30 years of being with artists who share your journey and who get it. And that's the key thing with great art, whether you're a theater company, dance company, or band, is that you reach a level of telepathy that you're people who've been around you, and that in great organizing and politics is the same thing, that you can anticipate each other. You kind of feel and intuit what's going with other people, even when it's not explicit. And that is the magic, you know, of, of humanity, the science of our soul, so to speak, that we have this capacity to be empathetic, to have empathy, but also telepathy, but telepathy not on the level of vocabulary or text, much more about feeling, about listening to breath, you know, of sensing rhythms, that sort of thing. In a lot of ways, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, the capacity of human beings um, that unfortunately has been so alienated and stultified under capitalism, but, that, but the capacity to really exceed uh, you know, our literal physical selves. And so I'm interested in, for example, interspecies communication. How human-made music can communicate with animals. And so when I was working on uh, the altissimo or extended range of the baritone saxophone in this little cabin in the woods in, my, in, 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 the woods in Wyoming, at 1 a.m. I was practicing and I was trying to get above the fifth octave. And, you know, when, when it goes above the seventh octave, and a half octave, it's beyond human hearing. And I was trying to achieve that, and I wasn't sure could I do it or not, because you can't hear it, I can't hear it myself. But then all of a sudden, one evening at 1 a.m., these wolves came by, and they were howling when I was doing it. You know, and they stopped when I went, went further down into the human range. And then they would howl again when I went beyond the human range. And it happened for three nights in a row, so I knew it wasn't, you know, <coughs> you know, a, serend you know a, a, a fluke. And you, I just realized that, you know, we have the capacity if we submit and subordinate ourselves to nature to have profound relationships with so many other beings, you know, but it's so hard because we can't even have good relationships with ourselves. Yeah.